around 1000 AD, medieval Orsi, Burkina Faso. The sound of a shattering pot awakens a young boy who, dazed, wanders from his hut. The village is unusually busy today. Men, women, and children hurry about, delivering mud, straw, and dung to masons who shape a mixture of these into rough bricks that dry in the Sahelian sun. One of the masons, noticing the half-asleep boy, asks him to refill a calabash with sorghum beer. As the boy does so, he watches the masons shape their mud into rough rectangles by hand, fussing over details until they're satisfied and when they are, running their fingers along a surface as a finishing touch. The plan, one tells him, is to build seven new huts, a notable expansion of the village ushered on by a population increase, a population increase itself brought on by connections to West Africa's growing trade networks. But though they've heard of them through the tales of passing caravans and pastoralists, the vast metropoles of Jenne Jeno, Ile Ife, and Kumbi Sale are distant to even the most well-traveled of Orsi's villagers, uh, completely beyond the scope of our boy's imagination. More tangible to him is the cow the villagers have bought from the pastoralists to eat in celebration. These seven huts will become the first of the Orsi Hubiro house complex, which will prosper for one or two hundred years until it and the entire 14 house village will be burnt to the ground. But because Orsi Hubiro was destroyed so suddenly and for an archaeologist so perfectly, it gives us a small light, illuminating even if only briefly, what it was like to live in medieval West Africa. The 300 square meter Orsi Hubiro house complex, which could have housed anywhere between 5 and 75 people, was built of mud brick, mud mortar, and wood easy to get materials for the villagers of Orsi. They would have probably harvested their mud from the Mer d'Orsi, or translating from French, Orsi Sea to their south, a sort of natural water reserve surrounded by sand dunes and sustained by yearly rains. It's hard to give Orsi Hubiro an architectural style. Uh, not only is it unique among known contemporary structures, it's also pretty obviously different from anything built in the modern era. But that doesn't mean that it can't be compared to contemporary, or modern, traditions in Burkina Faso and neighboring countries. Some of the most interesting design choices are the two-story room at about the center of the complex, which was probably a shrine, and the use of a roof as a kind of terrace. This would have probably been accessed by a ladder made of a log leaned against a wall. But though modern groups as far north as the Dagon of Mali and south as the Somba of Benin and Togo cut notches and other designs into these logs, we don't know if this was done at Orsi. The charred remains of the log found at Orsi Hubiro show no evidence of carving. Climbing on top of the roof, one would have seen people engaging in day-to-day -day activities, notably preparing food by grinding grains like pearl millet and sorghum into fine powders. These, alongside cowpeas, were important staple crops used across West Africa that were eaten along with hunted lungfish, catfish, and tortoises, and domesticated animals. That said, while we found evidence of animal husbandry alongside the spears and arrowheads that could have been used for hunting, no agricultural tools have been found in Orsi Hubiro. There's a chance, then, that the people there weren't farmers, and if this is true, then it might show that the village of Orsi invested into craft specialization, meaning that people, uh, well, uh, specialized in making certain goods which they then traded with others. Usually this is associated with an agricultural surplus, meaning that a group of farmers made more than enough food to feed themselves, which means that they had extra food to trade. So, in other words, the people in Orsi Hubiro might not have needed to farm because they could trade something they made for the food that they needed to live. So then, what were they making? Well, we know they kept animals. We have evidence of goats, sheep, horses, and donkeys through their fossilized poop, which has been found across the house. So, uh, make of that what you will. Uh, but aside from that, we're not exactly sure, and they could have done more than one thing. 
We found iron slag, which is a byproduct of smelting iron ore, but we found way more of it in the nearby complex of Orsi 9713. So, if the people at Orsi Hubiro were working iron, they weren't the main producers of it in the village. What we can probably say is that the people in Orsi Hubiro were tanners, by which I don't mean that they were getting tans, though maybe they did that too, I don't know, uh, but rather that they were making leather. While this is only shown indirectly, the evidence for it is pretty strong. Uh, both Acacia nilotica and Hematite powder have been found in the complex, and both of these are heavily associated with making leather in both West Africa and the broader world. Now, in the context of West African history, goatskin leather and leather-bound goods were major exports, prized in North Africa and exported to Europe as Morocco leather. Of course, we already know that people were keeping goats in Orsi Hubiro, meaning that while it's impossible to know, it's entirely possible that Orsi was one of the areas where that famous goatskin leather was made. Of course, Orsi wasn't just exporting goods into that world, and Orsi Hubiro tells us a lot about what the villagers imported from the caravans, migrating pastoralists, and regional traders with whom they interacted. Figuring out what was imported, though, is kind of tricky, and here it's again important to remember how much archaeology has yet to be done. Uh, for example, textile remains could be imports, but because they resemble those at the nearby site of Kisi, and because Kisi is so close to Orsi, they just as easily could be evidence of a shared textile tradition. More interesting are the pots, some of which have styles otherwise unknown to northern Burkina Faso, but well testified to in parts of Nigeria, the Tichit culture, and the Middle Niger. A copper bell, which looks like those found in contemporary Senegal, and the cowrie shells, probably from Cypria monida, imported from the Maldives through North Africa. These cowrie shells in particular were probably highly prized. We have evidence that they were used as jewelry, and they often take on ritual purposes in many different cultures, and were to develop into a currency system used across West and parts of Central Africa. Which, by the way, cowries turning into a currency system being uh, known to happen uh, all over the world, actually. <laughs> Unfortunately for the people of Orsi, greater connection to West Africa might have spelled their doom. We don't know why exactly it happened, but sometime in the late 11th or early 12th century, the house complex of Orsi Hubiro, alongside the entire village, was burnt down. That this was intentional seems hard to avoid, aside from the fact that we're dealing with mud brick buildings that would have been pretty hard to set ablaze. We should note that all 14 compounds in the village were lit on fire. All of them mud brick. The question turns to why the entire village was burnt to the ground. The archaeologists who worked on the site are skeptical of the idea that the attack was a slave raid because according to them it was an act of quote political and strategic violence and couldn't have been a slave raid because nothing seems to have been stolen. Yet while I do agree that slavery is an often overemphasized element of African history, I don't personally agree with excluding the possibility. Slaving was a worldwide industry, and the argument here implies that the main goal of a slave raid is to do anything but rob a site of its people. On the other hand, one should be careful not to overstate the case for a slave raid. A chain has been found on the site which might have been used to keep slaves, but by the same token it just as easily could have been meant to secure a horse, and the room within which it was found has a wooden post, suggesting that it could have been used for just that. While anywhere between 5 and 75 people could have lived in Orsi Hubiro, only three bodies have been found in it, an adult male and female and a child. Of them, only the female was clearly killed by an attack. Apparently she was cut twice, probably while trying to flee, while the other two bodies might have been attacked and killed by blunt force, but also could have suffocated while the building was burning to be crushed by falling debris. 
In the broader context of West African history, Ursi was on the frontier of powerful kingdoms. The city of Gao, center of a powerful kingdom, was only about a hundred miles, a few days journey away, and much of the Sahel had been thrown into tumult by the Almoravid attempt to conquer the Wagadu Empire to the west. Maybe the reasons for the attack are just too multifaceted to easily figure out, but regardless, because it was so sudden, and not so little was taken during the attack means that, in a way, it has perfectly frozen a view into West African history. The best archaeological sites are often also the sites of tragedy. Sometime in the 10 or 1100s, Ursi Burkina Faso. A small band of people approached the ruins of their village. Only a few days prior, it was attacked, its mud brick and wood buildings burnt to the ground. Because the attack happened towards the end of the dry season, the band desperately needs some sort of shelter for the oncoming seasonal rains, and surveying the ruins of one house, it was lived in by the village tanners. They therefore scavenge for some goods and erect a temporary abode. Though they find no one, alive at least, in the village, they hope they'll be joined by other survivors so that they can eventually rebuild. Those survivors, if they exist, don't come in large numbers, and the settlement never regains its former glory. A small settlement in the ruins of the site will survive for another hundred or so more years, but the settlers will eventually leave the site, the husk of what was once a prosperous village to be forgotten to history. Hey everyone, I uh, hope you all enjoyed the video. I am happy to announce that it's part of a broader history collaboration called South of the Sahara, hosted by the From Nothing YouTube channel. Uh, I'll let you figure out what it's about. <laughs> but if my upload schedule leaves you wanting more African history videos, then uh, make sure to check out the playlist somewhere on the screen. Uh, also, I've made a Twitter account where I post more often than on here, which <laughs> To be honest, that's not really saying much, but hey, uh, mostly it's photos of things that interest me from pre-colonial African history. So if you guys like pictures, then check that out. And I guess it's also about time that I mention my Patreon page. Uh, if any of you guys are willing to throw some dollars my way, it would be greatly appreciated. I'll be working on some much bigger projects in the future, and I'm looking forward to that. So uh, stay tuned, and I'll see you all in the next one.